Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and our first question is from Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government whether decisions regarding Highlands and Islands enterprise, economic development and social support spending will be made locally by people who live and work in the area. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Highlands and Islands Enterprise will continue to be locally based, managed and directed to provide dedicated support to the Highlands and Islands economy. Rhoda Grant. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary at what level of financial assistance will high staff have to revert to the board? I'll, I'll repeat that. At what level of financial assistance will high staff have to revert to the bo board for a decision? While the government insists that there's support for their plan of an overarching board, none of the 126 published responses show that. Could it be that everyone else wants to see major decisions relating to the Highlands and Islands taken in the Highlands and Islands? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. The issues in relation to um, uh, financial matters, we have said, I think last week, I said in the Chamber that uh, the decision making uh, remains with uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. In terms of the governance, that has been taken forward by a number of people in the Ministerial Review Group, which includes people uh, from Highlands and Islands themselves. And I think I would disagree with the uh, number that, which has been provided by Rhoda Grant. Uh, over 300 uh, people or individuals or groups uh, responded uh, to that. And within that, substantial uh, numbers of people were saying that, for example, SDS, SE, Strathclyde University and others were talking about the need for a, an overarching strategic board. So there was support for that, there was evidence for that, but it's been our view that in relation to what High currently does, it does very well, but it's also the case that some other things which have been brought to the Highlands, for example, the first ever government to commit to the duelling of the A9, the A96, before any previous government did that, the establishment of a city deal, the work done by my colleague uh, Fergus Ewing in relation to the Rio Tinto investments, these all have un happened in addition to what High has done. And what we want to do is to make sure more of that happens. So it could, of course, well be the case that High, far from the, paint, uh, the picture painted by uh, Rhoda Grant and others, ends up with uh, more authority and more powers than it did at the start of this review. Uh, can I take Kate Forbes? Thank you, Presiding Officer. When High's predecessor, the Highlands and Islands Development Board, was first established, its founder, Willie Ross, said the Highlands needed an agency with the powers to deal comprehensively with every obstacle in the way of economic and social improvement. Mm -hmm. Will High continue to be in a position to do that? Cabinet Secretary. The government has made it clear that we will maintain the dedicated support, including High's uh, strengthening communities remit, which I think is the basis of uh, Kate Forbes' question. And that remit will be locally based, managed and directed by High, and will protect the unique services that High delivers for our Highlands and Islands economy. But as I said in my previous response to Rhoda Grant, it's our intention that uh, High should be more than that in terms not least of a uh, potentially skills, but certainly in terms of international support for attracting international investment. We believe there's more that can be done in relation to the activities of High. So yes, those vital components of what High had done up till now will remain, but hopefully with additional powers and support from the other agencies which are subject to this review. Donald Cameron. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the campaign to save the High Board has received the support from its former chairman and member of his own party, the respected Professor Jim Hunter, who not only accused the government of committing an assault on its founding principles, but also said that in a country as diverse as ours, this centralism run rut needs resisting. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the comments of his own party member? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I think the SNP is a broad church. I think it's fair to say that. And we have people with uh, different views within the party, which well, I think is important in a democratic party, which kind of gives a lie to previous accusations from that side of the chamber. Uh, but it is important to recognize, uh, as I've done already, that the Highlands and Islands, uh, of course, the development agency uh, has substantial support within the Highlands for the work that it's done over many years. That is why we have said that we intend to maintain uh, Highlands and Islands Agency it will be enshrined as it is as a legal agency. The chief executive will remain there, the staff will remain there. The same people that are providing those vital services which are mentioned will also remain. But as I've said in relation to the two previous answers, we think it's possible to build on what's been done there and to achieve even more. Question number two, John Lamond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to concerns regarding the future of the Jim Clark rally. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. 
Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of events such as the Jim Clark rally, but we also need to balance the potential for economic benefit from such events with the imperative for a high degree of safety, both for spectators and road users. Uh, John Lamond. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I welcome the fact that we now have some progress on the investigations into the tragic events of 2014. The Jim Clark rally contributes greatly to the border's economy and its loss over the last few years has really impacted on local businesses. Thoughts are now turning to the 2017 event, which the organisers have told me is within weeks of being cancelled. So can, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Government will do all it can, alongside Police Scotland and Scottish Borders Council, to facilitate the holding of a closed road rally event next year? And can she confirm that the holding of a fatal accident inquiry does not preclude the rally taking place? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to, to John Lamont that uh, I'm aware that the event organisers have notified Scottish ministers of their intention to hold the, the Jim Clark rally in 2017 and have also submitted a report setting out how the promoters intend to implement the Motor Sport Association stage rally safety requirements. That report is under consideration. Um, we as ministers remain uh, with the with a, a higher level supervisory role, the member will be aware that it's Scottish Borders Council as the, the lead road and traffic authority that remains the authority along with Police Scotland, which authorises the detailed arrangements for the rally. Um, another factor to be considered, as the member said, is the announcement on the 1st of December by the Crown Office to establish a fatal accident inquiry into the tragic deaths of a spectator at the, the Snowman Rally in January 2013 and the deaths of the three spectators at the Jim Clark Rally in May 2014. I'm happy to make sure that um, the, the member is kept uh, abreast of the, the report being under consideration and any further developments, and I can ask the, the Minister for uh, Public Health and Sport to write to him to keep him uh, appraised of the, of the facts. Question number three, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that the NHS has sufficient stocks of blood for the winter period. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Uh, each year, the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service, SNBTS, makes robust plans to raise awareness of the need for blood donations during the winter period and maintain supplies of blood across Scotland. SNBTS employs various strategies to boost the number of donors. For example, through the period, SNBTS will be contacting existing donors to build supplies of each of the eight major blood groups. And a television campaign commenced on the 28th of November, supported by a digital <coughs> campaign. I'd just like to take the opportunity, presiding officer, to thank all donors for their support. And I would encourage everyone who can to donate. Stuart McWillan. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Blood stocks have a limited shelf life, thus it's impossible to stockpile supplies, and I think it's something that we would all accept. However, at the beginning of the week, uh, O negative, O plus, and B uh, negative, we are down to five and six days supply. Uh, will the Scottish Government increase uh, the promotional output for the annual Give Blood campaign uh, to encourage more people to either give blood for the first time or to return? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service aims to stock a six-day supply of every major blood group. Uh, at the current time, they have six or more uh, days supply of all but two of the eight main blood groups, with a five-day supply of O positive and B negative blood. Uh, as a result, they do not currently have significant concerns about stock levels at present. However, we will, of course, uh, fully support SMBTS's uh, publicity campaign to encourage more blood donations over the winter period. In addition, we're supporting their efforts to encourage new donors. And as I said in my earlier answer, if you've never given uh, blood before, you couldn't pick a better time to start than during the festive period. Question number four, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to assist sites in Scotland that are preparing to apply for licences to operate as spaceports. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, we remain focused on ensuring that a spaceport is based in Scotland and the Scottish Government and its agencies will provide advice and support to any Scottish airfield that wishes to pursue the spaceport opportunity. The, the modern transport bill, which includes the spaceport legislation and the licence process, is not due at Westminster until early 2017. It will then take a year to become law, so the Civil Aviation Authority is not expecting to issue the licence process until 2018. 
We await clarification from the UK Government regarding the infrastructure requirements involved in becoming a spaceport. This clarity is necessary to allow sites to develop viable business models for possible spaceflight operations. The Scottish Government and its agencies will continue to support Scottish sites in any way that they can at the appropriate time. Currently, each site has the ability to have direct contact with the CAA for updates and inquiries on the process. David Stewart. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary would be well aware that the UK space sector is one of Britain's fastest growing and most innovative industries. The Discovery Space UK bid to licence Macrohanish as a horizontal launch spaceport facility would be the UK's first commercial spaceport. A fully functioning runway already of 3,000 metres is already an alternative landing site for the US Space Shuttle. Will the Cabinet Secretary look again at enterprise area status for Macrohanish, an area that outscored two existing enterprise areas in the 2011 appraisal process? Cabinet Secretary. As I said in my initial response, I would say uh, to David Stewart that it's really up for each area to say if they want to participate in this bid and also to put in place the things which they think would advantage that application. And I say that because until it's uh, obvious from the uh, UK government's uh, taking through of the modern transport bill, what the infrastructure requirements and the business models would be for a spaceport bid, I think it's necessary that we have the clarity on that before individual applications or areas which want to apply actually put together their um, infrastructure uh, and other um, supporting uh, initiatives to, in order to help that bid. So I think we really have to await that clarification before we can take forward further commitments in relation to any particular bid that arises. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, Cabinet Secretary. Following the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding between Prestwick Airport and Houston on Tuesday, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that provided Prestwick Airport can meet the licensing obligations, it is now the preferred site for horizontal takeoff space launches in Scotland, and that Prestwick MRO infrastructure could also be used to support vertical takeoff space launches at other Scottish sites? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, what I've said in relation to the previous response applies to any sites, but I do, of course, recognise some of the points made by John Scott in relation to the work that Presswick Airport has undertaken uh, and also the advantages, as I mentioned, the advantages for Macrahanish in terms of the runway and so on. So uh, I think Presswick Airport is putting in place uh, an awful lot of uh, infrastructure. They have certain benefits already, of course, uh, but it would also require, as the member well knows, further infrastructure development for Presswick, whether to take forward a bid. But again, both for Presswick and for Macrahanish, both will want to see the progress of the bill going through the UK Parliament to know exactly what the infrastructure requirements will be and also the best possible business model should they decide to bid. Kenneth Gibson. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I hear what the Cabinet Secretary actually says, but as John Scott pointed out, Glasgow, Prestwick Airport and Houston Spaceport have formed an exciting new partnership and met just two days ago. And Prestwick already has 3,000 aerospace engineers working there. Will the Scottish Government now finally commit itself to the bid from Prestwick, which is an airport, not an airfield like Macrahanish, in order to boost Scotland's chances of securing the UK and Europe's first operational spaceport? Cabinet Secretary. Uh -huh. I don't think I'd want to deviate from the responses I've given to the previous two answers, uh, President Officer, but I, I would say that I think it's also possible and has been mooted in the past that both the uh, air, air, airfields, airports, would wish to work together uh, in relation to this. And of course, that is uh, something that remains possible. But uh, the same point applies that really for any bids, and I do recognise the work that's been undertaken at Presswick and I recognise the aspirations at Macrahanish, but these things to be given full form really require to know what will be required in terms of infrastructure. We don't know that definitively yet. And of course, once we know what the infrastructure requirements are, then those that are keen to bid will know how to put together the business plans. And I think we have to await that process at the same time as encouraging those that want to participate. Question number five, Patrick Harvey. Yes, back on earth, can I ask the Scottish <laughs> Government what impact it expects its, income, its tax policies to have on inequality of wealth and income? Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government will set out its proposals for tax policies in its draft budget, which will be published on the 15th of December, and the Scottish Government is committed to delivering policies which support the delivery of inclusive growth. Patrick Harvey. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has said uh, on many occasions, and I agree, that it is wrong to give a tax break to wealthy people, in the, particularly in the current context when very many people are struggling. But the cumulative effect 
of the personal allowance change at UK level and the Scottish Government's proposal to change the threshold on the higher rate will mean a tax cut for high earners of about £178 a year. This at a time when the Scottish Government does have the ability to claw back what's been given by the UK Government to the wealthy and ensure a more progressive policy. If the Scottish Government's not going to do that, what's the Cabinet Secretary going to spend his extra 15 quid a month on? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I've said uh, to members in the Chamber, I look forward to setting out the uh, budget uh, proposition on the 15th of December. There are some matters that Patrick Harvey has raised in the past, uh, citing Resolution Foundation. They work in a number of areas, including the personal allowance and the interplay with Social Security decisions as well. But what this government will take forward is a balanced approach on taxation to fund high-quality public services in a package that's fair and reasonable uh, to the public and the taxpayers of Scotland, and a proposition that uh, gained the support of the people at the most recent Scottish Parliament elections. Question number six, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Cabinet Secretary whether uh, he will consider making Scottish history a priority subject on the school curriculum. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, learning about Scotland's history, heritage and culture is promoted and supported in the context of Curriculum for Excellence. This includes a unit on Scottish history in the National 4, National 5 and Higher History courses. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In my constituency of Strathkelvin and Bears Den, we're currently celebrating the Thomas Muir Festival, an annual event organised by the Friends of Thomas Muir to commemorate the father of Scottish democracy. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that our children should learn all there is to know about Scotland's great pioneers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, y yes, I do. And I think it's important that uh, there is a deep understanding of the, uh, the figures in Scottish history who have shaped our country, shaped its values and shaped its identity. And I think the opportunity for this to be developed through our curriculum is a, a, a significant a opportunity for schools and for young people to appreciate uh, the depth of Scottish history and the contribution of individuals such as Thomas Muir to the formation of what we know to be modern Scotland today. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that our Scottish culture, both history and literature, should be embedded in our children's learning. And I refer to the Cabinet Secretary's letter to me of 8 November when I raised the issue of literature, and I quote, many primary schools study the works of Burns, for example, close quotes. But isn't that the problem? In my day a few moons ago, you did, in quotes, Burns in January. Has much changed, or is it still the case that the study of Scots literature is peripheral, if I may say so, even tokenistic? Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, well, I, I, I have to say that I, I, I wasn't around when Christine Graham was at school. Oh. Um, but um, from, my, from, my, from, my, from, my, from my wild speculation of what might have been going on at that time, um, I, I, think it is, I think it is very important that there is a broad understanding of the uh, contribution to literature from Scottish authors. And I think I see evidence of that in a range of different ways within the school curriculum. Uh, the uh, understanding of the work of our maker, uh, Jackie Kay, is important. There is, uh, within the, uh, some of our certificated qualifications, a requirement to uh, consider a text from Scottish literature. So in all of these respects, there is, I think, due account to be taken. But the, the serious point that Christine Graham makes is that there is a significant contribution from Scottish literature to, um, our, ed to, to, to our education system and to um, knowledge within our country, and that should be a central part of what young people experience as part of their education. Question number seven, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will introduce personal physical literacy programmes such as the STEP programme in schools as part of its obesity strategy. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. So the evidence on tackling obesity says that for success we must maintain activity across a wide range of actions that make it easier for people to be more active, to eat less and to eat better. As part of the review process on our strategy, we will be considering how we link our obesity strategy to other cross-government work, including that on promoting physical activity and developing our approach to being a good food nation. I will be meeting with Kenny Logan to discuss the STEP programme earlier in the new year. 
along with the Daily Mile, the STEP programme is another example of how physical activity can be embedded into the daily life of Scottish schools, which we know can have a positive impact on a pupil's health, educational attainment and life chances. Brian Whittle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Now, my frustration here, Cabinet Secretary, is the Government always talks about the importance of physical activity in tackling obesity, but there is little action. The very principle of the Government's getting it right for every child policy would suggest that meeting the individual needs of every child is fundamental. The rate that each child learns physical literacy is diverse as the rate in which they learn numeracy, literacy uh, and uh, language. Given the recognition that there is an, alar an alarming decline in child uh, activity rates linked to the rise in obesity and poor mental health, why does the government treat physical literacy as the poor relation in a child's education? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we've been round the houses of this question before, Mr Whittle and I, and I, I don't, uh, don't recognise the uh, portrayal of Scottish education that Mr Whittle uh, sets out to Parliament today. Um, there is a very high level of engagement and participation um, within uh, activities such as the Daily Mile across Scottish schools. 98% um, of schools are fulfilling their commitments in relation to physical education. And I see countless examples as I go around the country of schools <laughs> taking every effort to encourage um, physical activity and exercise and an emphasis on health and well-being within the activities of Scottish education. So I'm uh, very committed to this area of activity. I think it's reflected within Education Scotland. And I hope that uh, Mr Whittle can recognise some of the achievements that have been made by Scottish schools in promoting physical activity amongst children.